Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the nice introduction, Philomena. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, and it's a pleasure uh, to be part of um, this celebration. Um, uh, it really does suit Meitner's story, I think, which is a very rich one and a very complex one. Um, Lisa Meitner was a physicist. Uh, as a physicist, uh, her work traced the development of atomic science in the first half of the 20th century from the early years of radioactivity to nuclear physics to the discovery of nuclear fission. So that in the first half of the 20th century, um, she was really a major um, uh, physicist, as we know. Also, as a woman in science, um, she was a pioneer, one of the first women scientists to have a really prominent, well-recognized career uh, and a visible one. And her story really is also very closely tied to the history of that time for she, uh, because she was a Jew in Germany and this affected her very deeply. It affected her work and the way it was perceived. And so these are some of the things that I want to talk about in this talk today. Um, in telling uh, Meitner's story, I have decided that I want to focus on the discovery of nuclear fission, um, not because it was her only discovery or even because maybe it was not even her most important one, but because so many things came together at just that time. The discovery, as some of you may know, uh, took place in December 1938, took place in Berlin. Uh, it was a purely scientific discovery, as it's always described, very small scale, using very simple instruments, as you will, sh as you will see. Uh, and that's why another reason it's marvelous to be in this incredible laboratory and to see this contrast between um, how things started and how things have, have developed. Um, the discovery of nuclear fission was also a surprise discovery, and it was made without the slightest foreknowledge of the uses to which it would eventually be put. Lisa Meitner was the physicist on the team that discovered nuclear fission. In writing her biography, I found a very strong documentary record that convinced me that this was a highly interdisciplinary um, uh, discovery, which involved physics and chemistry, experiment and theory. My conclusions directly contradicted which what for many years had been the standard account of the discovery, which emphasizes chemistry at the expense of physics and relegates Lisa Meitner and physics to the periphery. Obviously, there was a discrepancy here. And to resolve it, I found that one has to really look at the science in closely and also at the personal um, historical context of the discovery. And that's crucial here, because this discovery, as I said, took place in Germany under the Nazis. And Lisa Meitner was forced out of Germany just before the discovery took place. And to me, it became clear that it was not science, but racial persecution that prevented Lisa Meitner from fully sharing in the discovery. And it wasn't science, but politics and personal ambition, and eventually gender bias, too, that artificially separated the physics from the discovery and distorted the history of the discovery for many years afterward. I'll start with the usual account of the discovery, which I could call the pseudo-history, but that would look like I'm not being objective. So let me just call it the standard story. It goes like this. In 1938 in Berlin, there were two chemists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, who were bombarding uranium with neutrons. They were trying to synthesize elements beyond uranium, which, as you know, was the heaviest <laughs> element then. But instead, they discovered that they had produced some barium. And this was the first indication that the uranium nucleus had actually split. That's the standard story. It's very simple, uh, probably too simple. Because as soon as the story is expanded a little bit, 
physics comes in right away. The story notes that Lisa Meitner, a physicist, worked with Hahn and Strassmann for a while, that she was Jewish and that she left Berlin before the barium was found, and that she and her nephew, Otto Frisch, who was also a physicist, published the first theoretical interpretation of the fission process. But with or without Lisa Meitner, the standard story emphasizes that fission was a chemical discovery made by chemists in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry in Berlin. And here's the clincher. The Nobel Prize for the discovery was in chemistry and was given to the chemist Otto Hahn. Now, I should mention that over the years, there have been some scholars who included physics and Lisa Meitner more equitably. But the standard story was in place for really well over 50 years. And it has really remained. It's impossible to change history um, as it's been written for so many years. And so the story remains quite uh, pervasive. And the reasons for this are pretty clear. First of all, fission was a sensational discovery. Second of all, Otto Hahn became exceptionally famous after the war as a result of this discovery. Also, the Nobel Prize tends to be dazzling. That's a whole other story. And undoubtedly, because people thought also that it was only natural that if a woman was scientist was there, she would have to be at the margins. And in the end, the standard story was copied and repeated so often uh, that even serious historians of science still continue to cite it uncritically. The interesting thing, though, is that you only have to dig a little bit to find that the standard story is very flawed. Uh, for one thing, it places all the action uh, in December of 1938. But as soon as you start reading the scientific publications of the period, you can clearly see that this was a four-year-long investigation, a team investigation, that lasted from 1934 to 1938. And when you do this, you also see that nuclear physics was as essential as chemistry was at every stage of this investigation. The standard story never mentions that Lisa Meitner initiated the work in Berlin and that she was the scientific leader of the team for four years, as one can see from the publications. And that even after she escaped from Germany in the summer of 1938, she went to Sweden, she continued to collaborate with Hahn and Strassmann through her correspondence with Otto Hahn. And the story most especially does not reveal that it was she who urged Hahn and Strassmann to perform the final experiments that led to the discovery of barium. All these things are documented in the scientific publications and also in private letters and papers. But in the standard story, Meitner and physics are almost entirely absent. The story is also politically sterile. And that is no accident. Because the standard story is, in fact, Otto Hahn's version of the discovery. And it's a version that he constructed a few weeks after the discovery took place in the winter of 1939. He, he constructed this story to protect himself at a time of political oppression and fear. Hahn was Lisa Meitner's closest friend and colleague. He knew that her forced immigration was unjust. He knew that she fully deserved to share in the discovery. But he was afraid to say so at that time. Remember, this was Germany in, the win in that winter of 1938-39. It was a few weeks after the Kristall Kristallnacht pogrom. And things were getting rough for Jews, of course but also for people who were friends and colleagues of Jews. Hahn could not insist that Lisa Meitner's name be included when he and Strassmann published the barium finding. And he was really afraid for himself and his position. He was afraid that others would find out that he had continued to collaborate with her after she had left Berlin. And we know this because Otto Hahn openly expressed this fear in letters that he wrote to Lisa at the time. Only a few weeks after the discovery took place, Hahn deliberately distanced fission from physics and himself from Lisa Meitner. He claimed that the discovery belonged only to chemistry. And as I said, Hahn's version became the standard story. It was recognized by Nobel Prize. And this was the history of the discovery for many years. I should mention there's also um, a false Lisa Meitner story, which you may have run across. After World War II, after the atomic bomb, she became a hero in the Allied countries, in Britain and the United States, mostly, um, and especially here in the United States. It really was a very, very good story. Here is this tiny, brilliant woman. She's a refugee who fled from the Nazis. She's a famous physicist associated with the discovery of fission. That much was true, of course. 
Um, but then the media made her into a spy and a war hero. They, they characterized her as the brave Jewish woman who had smuggled the secret of nuclear fission out from under the noses of the Nazis and brought it to America. That was actually in an article on the front page of the New York Times, just under the fold, on August 7th, 1945, the day after Hiroshima. And that, of course, was not true at all. First of all, um, Lisa did not smuggle scientific secrets. The discovery was openly published uh, in the scientific literature in early January of 1939, which was nine months before the war in Europe began. So that the Germans and everyone else knew all about the discovery. And in fact, the German military began looking into the nuclear fission uh, discovery in April of 1939, long before the Allies did that. But the story was too appealing, and eventually it was condensed into Lisa Meitner as, quote, the Jewish mother of the atomic bomb. And that, of course, was false on every count. Technically, she wasn't really Jewish. Uh, she was of Jewish origin, but she had been baptized Protestant. And she was never anyone's mother. And this is really important. She had, in fact, refused an invitation to go to Los Alamos during the war. She absolutely would not work on a bomb. This makes her one of the very few scientists on either side uh, who did not work um, on a weapon uh, when asked. Anyway, so much for the accuracy of the New York Times. Um, there's been other situations since, of course. Meitner was a very private person, and the false story pained her. But eventually, the story faded because it was one of just those celebrity stories. And I mention it now mainly because you occasionally will find remnants of this story in textbooks and casual histories. Because, of course, when somebody wants to find out about something, they go and they look up the New York Times, and there it is. Um, Anyway, I came upon these stories when I first taught a course on women in science, which now, um, when I reflect back, it's almost 30 years ago. That's when women's studies first came onto campuses all over this country. And I really didn't know anything about history of science then. They only asked me because I was one of the few women that they could ask. Um, and I knew nothing, really nothing, about women in science, except, of course, I'd heard of Marie Curie, who hasn't. That's just the way things were then. Um, I mean, I went to a women's college, Barnard, in New York, um, learned nothing about women there. Then I went to Harvard, and for sure I didn't learn anything about women there. <laughs> um, but teaching that first women's studies class, you know, sort of staying a week ahead of the students, um, I learned that they really had always, historically, from ancient times, there always have been women in science throughout the centuries. And some of them were truly exceptional and very well recognized by their colleagues at the time. Um, but later, they hardly, um, we hardly knew of them, we hardly learned of them, and that's because over the centuries, historians disproportionately, and I think disgracefully, neglected those women. And so then each generation, women were always the exceptions, never the pioneers. Of course, things have changed now um, for the better, but we need to keep this in mind when we're looking at uh, histories from the, of the past. Anyway, when I first became interested in Lisa Meitner, she and her work had almost faded from view, just like so many of the women that I had just been reading about. In Germany, she was referred to as Otto Hahn's assistant, his Mitarbeiterin, which of course is a stereotypical role for, women, for a woman. Mostly she wasn't visible at all, which is also was a stereotype for women in science. Um, more recently though, in the last, I would say, 10 to 20 years, there's been a great deal of interest in Lisa Meitner, in, in part, of course, in the interest in, in women in science, but in part because in Germany especially, she represents a part of their history that they are not uh, trying to ignore. So before I talk about the science, here we have Lisa Meitner at about the age of 20, which is at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. It's a student picture. She was born in Vienna to an intellectual Jewish family. Uh, but religion played no part in the upbringing of her or her siblings, and she had herself baptized as a Protestant, as an adult. And I assume this is also a student picture because she looks so incredibly tired. <laughs> <laughs> she was fortunate in any number of ways, and one of them was that the University of Vienna opened its doors to women just about at the time that she was ready to go to university. She had to do extra preparations, but she was one of the first women 
to attend the University of Vienna. Uh, she entered in 1901, and she was the second to earn a doctorate in physics. And this is before computers. This is how people registered for classes. They paid their fees and got a little st stamp. And then they wrote down the classes that they took and paid more fees and got another little stamp. There's, there's one over here. And this was her third year in physics. And you'll notice, this is quite incredible, um, all of her physics classes, electricity, elasticity, mathematical physics, and so on, are taught by one professor. This is a, this is a high teaching load. And, um, and that professor was Ludwig Boltzmann. And he was really um, a mentor for her. Um, he was not only a great theoretical phys physicist, as we all know, but he was also an extremely charismatic teacher. And people said at the time that he was one of the great physics teachers of the 19th and the 20th century. He was really a tremendous influence on her. She received her doctorate in 1906. And then, because there was no professional opportunities for a woman in science, she decided to stay in school a little bit longer and go to Berlin for a semester or so to learn more physics. And when she did, she met her sec the second great theoretical physicist who was a formative teacher for her, and that is Max Planck. Max Planck was socially um, much more conservative uh, in his outlook than Boltzmann was. He did not, for example, favor university education for women. And when Lisa Meitner first came to Berlin, the University of Berlin and all the universities in Prussia were closed to women. So she was, again, an exception. But uh, Max Planck saw something in Lisa. And eventually, rather soon actually, he became a father figure to her and a mentor. And eventually, they became very close friends. And these two theoretical physicists were imp very important to Meitner's development. She always was an experimentalist, but she, the problems that she chose were always close to theoretical physics. And that um, worked very well in that particular period of atomic physics. But she was interested in doing experimental work, and in 1907, she started a uh, work in radioactivity with Otto Hahn, a chemist who was just her age. Um, radioactivity benefited from the start from an interdisciplinary approach. There were always chemists and phys physicists working together. And Meitner and Hahn also complemented each other personally. She was shy, as you, I think you can see from this picture. And he was very sociable and charming, kind of a good-looking guy, nice mustache. Um, during this period, Lisa was a, quote, guest, unquote, as she was called. She had no position, no status, and of course, no pay. That was the bad part by contemporary standards. But the good part, from her point of view at that time, was that she uh, could work at all um, in the laboratory. Um, in the past, um, even until quite recently, there are examples, it was, it was almost the norm for a woman to collaborate with a man if she wanted to do experimental work. Um, and very often, it was with a husband. Um, uh, it was a husband and wife that collaborated. Here's an example from the 1700s, Lavoisier. Uh, and his wife, Marie Anne Lavoisier, as you know, is the father, quote unquote, of modern chemistry. Um, but it's well known that his wife, Marie Anne, worked with him uh, through uh, most of his professional life. The disadvantage of such a, an arrangement for the woman <coughs> generally was that the woman's work was obscured um, by the man's. But in the early 1900s, when Lisa and Otto were working together, it was much more equitable. And part of it was because they were in two different fields. She in physics and he in chemistry. Neither could say that, uh, that one was more important or, or could dominate the other. And they were very successful. This, of course, was um, some of the physics instruments. And um, I'm not saying it was always this way, but look who's working and look who's posing for the picture. Anyway, <laughs> here, here they are. Lisa loved being in Berlin. It was a very nice group of, of young scientists who had good times together. Here they are on a picnic. And the other young woman here uh, is, um, is one of the Planck tw identical twin daughters. One never knows which one it is in the picture, because the other one was always taking the picture. And so uh, these, were, um, these were people who really had, knew how to have a nice time on the weekends and who worked very hard. Um, Lisa Meitner basically found a professional home in Berlin, and she did stay for 31 years. Um, people always ask whether there was ever a romance between Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner. Um, and physicists always ask this more than anyone. So there must be something going on here. But 
anyway, we, we don't think um, that apparently that there was no romance between them. There's certainly no evidence for it, and everybody has looked for it. But they were truly best friends from, uh, from a very early time. And even after Han married, here's his wife, Edith. He married in 1913. Lisa was close to his wife, and she became godmother to their son and godmother also to their grandson. So you see this was a, a close friendship, really a family relationship. Lisa would refer to um, Otto as her colleague brother. That was the kind of relationship they had. And it's important to keep this in mind when we see what happened later on. In 1912, a new institute was opened up, uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry. It was the first in the series of Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes. Now it's, these institutes in Germany are well known as the Max Planck Institutes, of course. But this was the very first one. Um, and as you can see, it was just built. And you can see why um, they called it after Kaiser Wilhelm. This is modeled after one of his hats <laughs> with one of the spiky thing on top. It's very nice. Um, and they, the advantage was they had wonderful new labs. And for Lisa, of course, it was a tremendous advantage because the first time in this new institute, which was not a university but a scientific institute, she was given an actual position and a pay that was basically comparable to Hans. So she had really achieved that after being six years in Berlin. She had something <coughs> excuse me, that was quite unusual. And here they are again in their laboratory. This one is clearly a chemistry laboratory, as was the one before. This was taken around 1918, shortly after um, their work in radioactivity had culminated in something very, which was very important, namely the, the discovery of a new radioactive element, protactinium, uh, element 91, which was discovered in 1918. Now, after the war, at this point, uh, their work separated. Uh, Otto Hahn um, stayed in radiochemistry, and uh, Lisa Meitner went on into what eventually became known as experimental nuclear physics. And um, at that time, nuclear physics, probing the nucleus, was mainly involved a really um, a deep knowledge of radioactivity, because that, those were the only nuclear reactions that they had available to them. And so th it, they used the alpha, beta, and beta emissions and uh, gamma radiation in order to learn something about the nucleus. And this was pretty much the situation before cyclotrons and before um, instruments of this sort. Um, that was what nuclear physicists um, did. And in the 1920s, Lisa Meitner became extremely well known um, for her work and was part of a really internationally prominent group of atomic and nuclear physicists world, uh, worldwide. Uh, when Niels Bohr visited Berlin, here he is. Uh, she, of course, was there, as was James Frank, uh, Otto Stern, of the, this was before the Stern Gerlach experiments. Um, and we ha here, of course, is Otto Hahn, one of the few chemists in this group. Here is Hans Geiger, who had not yet invi invented the Geiger-Muller counter, um, and, uh, and a number of other um, physicists. Uh, here again, uh, this was Meitner's circle in Berlin. We have James Frank here in 1921 and his wife, um, Lisa. Here is Otto Hahn. Here's Fritz Haber, of course. And of course, here is Einstein. Um, by the way, the, the other woman here is Hertha Sponer. Um, and she uh, was a student of James Franks and uh, became his second wife after his first wife died. And finally, another group picture. Um, Lisa Meitner was very small. Ernest Rutherford was very large. Um, <laughs> here we have Hans Geiger again. And this, this woman is Geiger's wife. Uh, here is James Chadwick. This picture was taken in the same year that the neutron was discovered by Chadwick. I don't know if uh, the photo was taken before or after the neutron. Um, and here we have um, other, um, uh, other physicists as well. So my point here is that Lisa Meitner was in a very prominent group, and she was in a very great place to do her physics, namely in Berlin, because it was one of the centers for the, de for the development of physics at the time. And here we have Lisa at about this time. I, I think this picture was taken around 1930, at, when Lisa was about 50. Um, she smoked, she worked in radioactivity, and she lived to be 90. 
After Hitler came to power in 1933, Lisa Meitner was not dismissed despite her Jewish origins. And this was in part because she was Austrian and in part because the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes were protected. They were not public institutions like the universities were. And so she decided to stay, although the situation was um, not very good. She did keep on working. She really clung to her institute, as she later said. She loved her institute. She had worked to build it up, and she did not want to leave. And during these years um, that she stayed in Nazi Germany, she initiated, uh, beginning in 1934, the so-called uranium investigation that led to the discovery of, of fission. It was she who recruited Hahn, uh, to, uh, and, and then they also recruited Fritz Strassmann, who's shown here, uh, a younger chemist. Um, Strassmann, by the way, was a, a courageous um, person. During World War II, he and his wife hid a friend, uh, a Jewish woman, in their apartment for several months. And this was a great risk in themselves, and they had a very young child. The friend survived, and uh, Strassmann is remembered with a tree planted um, in his name at the Israeli Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. This uh, picture was taken some time before uh, Lisa Meitner's escape from Germany in the summer of 1938. Uh, as I mentioned, Lisa Meitner took a position in Stockholm, and a few months after she left Germany, um, the discovery of fission took place. And she, together with her nephew, Otto Robert Frisch, who was also a refugee, um, gave the first theoretical um, interpretation of the fission process. During the war, uh, both sides worked on a uh, nuclear weapons project. Hahn was one of them. He was um, a, a prominent member of the German fission project. Um, and here's the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry uh, after an Allied air raid in February of 1944. By then, um, or shortly afterwards, Hahn and the Institute were moved to southern Germany. After the war, uh, Lisa was invited to the United States uh, for a semester as a visiting professor at the Catholic University um, of America in Washington, D.C. Um, this really was her celebrity time. Here she is at a banquet um, in February of 1946 with President Truman. And here uh, around 1950 is a portrait of her at the age of 70s taken in Sweden. She moved to Cambridge in 1960 to be close to her nephew, Otto Frisch, who was a professor uh, in Cambridge, England. And she died in 1968. And she's buried in a very small, simple uh, English uh, churchyard court, uh, 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 there. And on the grave, um, Otto Frisch um, wrote, a physicist who never lost her humanity. And um, the, the reference is to her refusal to work on an atomic bomb. Um, the next, this next slide is an, it gives you an indication of how, uh, how the discovery of nuclear fission was represented in Germany in the post-war period. It's a display in the Deutsches Museum uh, in Munich, um, and it basically has the physical apparatus that um, Meitner used, mo uh, was used mostly by Meitner. It was apparatus that was on a table in her laboratory, very simple table, uh, in her laboratory in her section in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry. And you'll notice that the um, label uh, that's on, on this uh, display says that it's the work table of Otto Hahn. And again, Otto Hahn's name is up here. Fritz Strassmann gets a lower um, case over here and without his first name. And Lisa Meitner's name is not mentioned at all. And that is the way it was. Um, for over 30 years in the Deutsches Museum uh, until about 1990. But if, if one looks closely at this display, and here's a close-up of the instruments, you'll see that it, this is mostly the physical apparatus um, that, that was used uh, in, uh, for the discovery. Uh, for example, here are the neutron sources in little tubes. Um, they were uh, radium ber uh, beryllium powder which was inserted into the middle of a paraffin block, which is here. And a sample of uranium was placed on the block. The purpose of the paraffin block was to slow the neutrons to get um, a stronger reaction. And then the uranium uh, target, which is this, which was wrapped in a little, which is uranium salt wrapped in a little piece of paper, was placed in um, lead vessels 
and then taken for analysis. And the rest of this is basically some of the um, Geiger counters and various amplifiers that were used to uh, do the counting. And the whole thing was powered by a bank of, of uh, batteries below. And the only indication on this display that chemistry actually was important to this, the discovery, which of course it was, is um, this Erlenmeyer flask, which was placed on the table uh, as an indication of this. Um, and so uh, this was the way that it was displayed as the Arbeitstisch, as the work table of Otto Hahn, uh, for over 35 years until 1990, when, it w when the, the display was changed to include Meitner and Strassmann more equitably. So what I would like to do now, um, I would like to talk uh, in more detail about the science uh, that went into the discovery of fission beginning in 1934. Um, the investigation began in Rome, actually, in 1934, uh, when Enrico Fermi and his group in Rome used neutrons to irradiate elements throughout the periodic table. These were the, the first neutron um, reactions came right after the discovery of the neutron. And what it, when they did this, they found a large number of induced reactions this way. They always found that the changes were very small. For example, a neutron might knock out a proton or an alpha particle. And that made sense to physicists because they knew that neutrons were very small, um, relatively insignificant particles. And they also knew that nuclei, even radioactive nuclei, are basically quite stable. And they found, Fermi and his group found that with heavier elements, with heavier uh, elements, the reaction was always neutron capture. Here it is. There's Fermi actually with, on a walk with Niels Bohr. In 1934, what Fermi found was he heavier elements, and um, the neutron capture always took place, followed by beta decay. And when he finally got to uranium, the heaviest element, he bombarded it with neutrons, and he found that there were several beta emitters that were formed. And so he assumed, quite reasonably uh, at the time, that neutron capture had taken place, followed by beta emission to element 93 and perhaps also to 94. And those were the first indication that perhaps transuranic elements had been found, the first time that this had been done. And, and, and people were extremely excited about it. It was kind of a sensation. It was even reported in the popular uh, press. Later, Lisa Meitner wrote that she was, as she said, fascinated by Fermi's findings. And these experiments that he did corresponded exactly to her area of expertise. Um, she knew that she needed help with the radiochemistry. If they were going to go into an unknown region of the periodic table, she wanted Han to work with her. He was really the best radiochemist around. And uh, so he, she asked Han to join her. And they started their first collaboration in many years. They hadn't collaborated since around 1920 directly. And they were joined by Strassmann a little later. Now, it's important to note uh, uh, that there were two guiding assumptions that were enforced for physicists and for chemists here. One was from nuclear physics. The other one was from chemistry. The physics um, assumption that I've already mentioned is that whenever nuclear reactions take place, that the changes are always going to be small, because that's what they had always observed up till that time. And also, there was theoretical um, justification for this. Um, the Gamow theory of alpha decay uh, it also predicted only small changes. And there was also the so-called liquid drop theory of the nucleus, which also said that nuclei are, are stable and, uh, st and sort of hang together, it, just like molecules in a drop of water. And no theory, no physics theory predicted, and no physicist even thought about anything as disruptive as the splitting of a, of a nucleus. It was simply not thought of. But the chemists also had a guiding assumption that turned out to be incorrect. And I'm just, this is here, our modern periodic table. I'm just reminding um, you that uranium is down here in the actinides. And, um, and this is, of course, um, uh, under the rare earths right here, the lanthanides. And here's the actinides. Here's uranium now. However, in the 1920s and 30s, we, we still had the rare earths over here. But uranium was considered to be a transition element. Uh, it, was, it was thought that starting with actinium and so on, that they were starting the, um, a fourth uh, 
transition series over here. And the reason that uranium was placed here as a transition element is that the, the various elements up to uranium appeared to have the chemistry of transition elements. They had similarities with the elements above them, which is typical for transition elements. And so it was also assumed, therefore, that 93, which would be here, 94, 95, and so on, that the transuranium elements would also be transition elements. And that turned out not to be true. And so the, the uranium investigation was guided by these two erroneous uh, assumptions, one from chemistry and one from physics. Later, Hahn would claim repeatedly that physics had led the investigation astray, in, astray by insisting that there only could be small changes in the nucleus. But he didn't mention that the assumptions of chemistry were also wrong. And these two assumptions turned out dovetailed and reinforced each other and kept the investigators in the dark for many years. Now, the Berlin team wanted to find they were looking for transuranic elements. That was the whole idea. So, they tur so it turned out they were always looking for elements with transition chemistry. They were looking for elements with chemistry similar to rhenium or osmium and so on. In the, uh, up to the platinum series over there. And their technique would be to irradiate a uranium sample with neutrons. And then using the known chemistry for transition elements, they would separate out the beta activities that had chemical properties that were similar to what they were looking for, um, namely 93, 94, 95, and so on, uh, which would be transition elements. And eventually, they found quite a few of these beta activities and found that they fell into a sequence of beta decays. So just as a reminder, um, this is fission as we now understand it. Um, a neutron, not shown, hits a uranium nucleus, which splits into two um, unequal parts. These are all heavy with, with neutrons. And so a series of beta decays takes place. And of course, this can happen in many ways. Uranium can split in a number of ways. So we have different series here of beta decays resulting from the fission of the nucleus. And you'll notice, when the Berlin team was looking for elements with transition metal chemistry, they, of course, found them because we have here, for instance, transition metals starting with zirconium. We have here um, uh, also, uh, again, uh, well, here we have, again, the, the, the zirconium one. And there is actually elements from all over the period, uh, all groups of the periodic table among this very varied group of um, uh, beta emitters that you get from, from the fission series. They, of course, didn't know they had fission. So this is what they thought they had in 1937. They thought they had gotten quite a few of the transuranic elements. In 1937, they had found three different processes that had taken place. The first one, they, they, regarded, it, they regarded them all as neutron capture. The first one, they thought they had a series of beta emitters, a long series going up possibly to element 97. Um, the second process was very much like the first one, same conditions, except the beta emitters had different properties. And again, on this one, they went all the way up uh, to 95 or 96. The third one was different, the third process. It was clearly a resonance capture of only slow neutrons. And they identified a 23-minute uranium, which was a beta emitter. But they never found this element here. And nor did they look for it. And the reason was that they were looking for transuranic elements. And they already thought they had a lot of them here. So why bother looking for this one, which turns out was the only one that was actually the one that was correctly interpreted. These two processes, processes one and two, are actually fission processes. And the long series of beta decays come from lighter elements that, um, that, were, uh, that are uh, fission fragments. Now, the chemical separations and procedures were published in a chemistry journal with Hahn as the senior author. And Meitner published her physical measurements and, and analyses generally in physics journals. The chemists, if you read these, these publications, they were really confident. They would say over and over that there was no doubt, no question, that they had new elements beyond uranium. But Meitner was the only physicist on the team. And it was her job to integrate all the data in, uh, from chemistry and radiochemistry and her own physical measurements into nuclear processes that made sense. And in her publications, she, so we can see what a struggle this was. She clearly realized here that process three was the most normal one. And that turned out to be correct. 
This is indeed uranium-239, and it does decay to element-93, neptunium, um, which, but that was not found until 1940 by Edwin McMillan and Philip Abelson in Berkeley. If the Berlin team had detected this 93, then they would have known right away from the chemistry that the ones, these up here, which they also thought were 93, were not correct because these have a different chemistry. But they didn't find this. Their neutron sources were too, too weak, and they didn't look hard, again, as I said, because they already thought they had so many transuranic elements that they were finding. But Lisa Meitner knew that something was wrong with processes one and two. She, first of all, couldn't understand how the capture of a single neutron could produce such great instability that it would take four or five beta decays to relieve it. Uh, there was no theoretical explanation for it. And also, what's really remarkable is that these process one and two are all isomeric. They all have a mass of 239. And so this would be a kind of inherited isomerism. And this had never been seen before, and, um, and, and of course, and turned out not to be correct. And there was no theoretical explanation for it. So until fission was recognized, none of this was clear, and the results were very confusing. And chemistry, as it turned out, had no way of detecting this error, but physicists at least were uncomfortable with it and realized that the more data they were getting, the less sense it was making. And we see it in Meitner's paper. She always ended on kind of a dissatisfied note. She would write, perhaps one should look elsewhere for an explanation, or she'd write, this result is very difficult to reconcile with current concepts of nuclear structure. The breakthrough actually came from Paris, from Irene Curie's laboratory in, in 1938. Irene Curie and her co-worker, Pavel Savage, searched the uranium products and found a new strong um, activity whose chemistry was very unclear to them. And by the time Hahn and Strassmann looked into it, it was October of 1938, and Lisa Meitner was already out of Berlin. She was in Stockholm. Hahn and Strassmann analyzed the new Curie activity and decided that it was an isotope of radium. They found an, ac uh, 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 they found an activity that they attributed to radium over here. Here's uranium. They attributed it to radium. And the reason they attributed it to radium is because in the general radiochemistry of that time, they used barium as a carrier for this very tiny amount of uh, radioactive material. And because barium was the carrier, uh, they assumed it was radium because they were in the same chemical group. Um, when Hahn wrote about this to Meitner, uh, she raised all sorts of questions. Uh, her objections were based on nuclear theory. She said, in order to get from uranium down to radium, you would have to have a very power, that's a, that's a big change of, uh, of, um, of four atomic numbers, she, basically two alpha particles. And no one had ever seen a neutron make that sort of reaction take place. And so Meitner was convinced from theoretical considerations that that wouldn't happen. In mid-November of 1938, Meitner went to Copenhagen to visit Bohr's Institute, and Hahn secretly came to meet her there, secretly because he really did not want to be known to associate um, with um, a Jew in exile. And he wanted to avoid political problems. And no one ever discussed it, uh, even in their letters later. But we know from Hahn's diaries that they met, and we know that Meitner objected strenuously to the radium, because that was the message that Hahn brought back to Strassmann in Berlin. And according to Strassmann, Hahn told him that Meitner urgently insisted that they verify the radium more carefully. Later, Strassmann wrote, she was the intellectual leader of our team, and she was still one of us. Fortunately, her opinion carried so much weight with us that we immediately began the necessary control experiments. And these were the experiments that led to directly to the barium finding uh, a few weeks later. So in December 1938, just before Christmas, Hahn informed Meitner that the so-called radium was not radium after all, but barium. He was sure of the chemistry, but he didn't understand it. And he wrote, perhaps you can come up with some fantastic explanation. We know that uranium cannot burst into barium. Meitner answered by return mail. She wrote, quote, it is puzzling, but one cannot say it is impossible. Now, this is really a very wonderful moment that normally is not revealed in publications. You can only get this when you see the private correspondence. Um, we see the discovery process um, taking place. Hahn and Strassmann had clearly broken a barrier. Their radiochemistry was exceptionally good. They were confident enough 
to recognize that they had barium. And Meitner was also, in a way, prepared for the unknown. When she heard of the barium, she didn't understand it yet in any kind of detail. But somehow she knew that the theoretical picture that had made her reject the radium did not prohibit a massive disintegration of the nucleus. Um, somehow she sensed that it was not impossible, and she wrote it to him. Later, Hahn was known to say that if Meitner had still been in Berlin, she might have, quote, talked him out of the barium, or, quote, she might have forbidden him to make the discovery. It's one of the many things that he said later that simply aren't true. We see from Lisa's letter, which he always had in his possession, that she said just the opposite. And at the time, Lisa's assurance that it was not impossible was important to Hahn, because a few days after he got her letter, he added a paragraph to the proofs of the, uranium, of the barium paper, <coughs> suggesting that uranium had split in two. And this strengthened Hahn and Strassmann's paper, because it indicated that they had not only found barium, but had recognized what had taken place. Just at that time, Meitner went to western Sweden to visit a friend for Christmas. And her nephew, Otto Frisch, who was in Ke Copenhagen wa working with Bohr, came to be with her uh, for the Christmas holiday. Both were accustomed to thinking of the nucleus as a liquid drop. That was the prevailing theoretical picture at that time. But now, they began to recognize that it could be a wobbly, oscillating drop that maybe was elongated and ready to split in two. Frisch realized that the surface tension of a large nucleus like uranium uh, might be very, very small. And Meitner quickly estimated how much mass would be converted in energy when the nucleus split. And suddenly, everything fell into place. The inter interpretation itself was a beautiful discovery. And it was recognized as such by physicists at that time. Bohr used it as a starting point for a more extended theory. And the physics community accepted Frisch and Meitner's name in English for the process, which is nuclear fission. Hahn and Strassmann published the barium finding in Naturwissenschaften. And Meitner and Frisch published their interpretation in Nature a few weeks later. And this emphasized now the separations that had taken place. The chemistry and the experimental work were in one place. Physics and theory were in the other place. And there was also the very symbolic division in that one publication was in German by Germans, and the other was in English by refugees from Germany. And people who, who did not understand the science and who did not want to think about the political situation at the time con might conclude and did conclude that the chemists discovered fission while the physicists merely interpreted it. And among those um, would be the members of the Nobel committees. As I said earlier, um, Hahn chose to exploit that division. In February 1939, just a few weeks after the discovery, Hahn defined the discovery to be just those chemical experiments that he and Strassmann had done in December. He did it in a letter to Meitner. He wrote, quote, we never did any physics. We only did chemical separations over and over again. He thought fission was a gift from heaven. That's the way he put it, which meant it was a miracle that would protect him politically. He chose to forget the physics and distance in himself from the person who had once been his best friend and closest colleague. And yet, I really do believe that it is clear that the science itself was integrated and interdisciplinary until the very end, and that the division didn't reflect the science, but was instead an artifact of Meitner's separation from Berlin and the political conditions of the time. Well, this much is documented. And because of this, um, I believe I've been able to make a convincing case to many scientists and historians of science. But there are other questions that we probably will never be able to fully document and resolve. And I'll just briefly conclude by um, pointing to a few of these questions. One can ask, for example, why the Nobel Committee awarded the prize to Hahn and not to Meitner. You know, there's many deserving scientists who never get a prize. Some of them may very well be in this room. But in Lisa Meitner's case, when her closest colleague got, got it for work that they did together and she did not get it, that was very damaging to her and to her reputation. So, so why didn't she get it? Um, Nobel documents are available after 50 years, so they're now available. And they show that these Nobel decisions were almost incompetent. They were hasty, and they were scientifically uninformed. That much is in the record. But why was the decision so careless? Why was Lisa Meitner simply um, sort of set aside? 
Um, we can ask the question, how much of it was due to the old Swedish cultural ties to Germany, which were very strong, and that tended to favor Hahn. And how much of it was due to Meitner's outsider <laughs> status in Sweden as a foreigner and a woman? Some of Meitner's friends said at the time that if she had emigrated to any country other than Sweden, she might very well have gotten the prize. Um, we, we can ask the question whether the Swedes have ignored, uh, why the Swedes, um, if the Swedes would have ignored a man of Meitner's scientific stature. And we can't answer these questions completely, but it certainly is fair to ask them. We can also ask why Hahn never tried to correct the record with respect to Meitner after the war when, he, when it would have been safe to do so. And these are questions about Hahn's character and his ambition and his capacity for self-deception. Meitner asked these questions at the time. She was bitterly disappointed in Hahn. And she also understood that his behavior was part of the post-war mentality in Germany. The country was defeated, and even good Germans like Hahn, who had hated the Nazis, were preoccupied with rebuilding the ru their ruined country. They didn't uh, look back to the injustices of the Third Reich, and they felt no particular obligation to make amends. On the contrary, many Germans at that time regarded themselves as victims of the Nazis and the war. And Hahn's failure to remember Meitner and her role in the discovery was really part of that period of forgetting. Hahn was exceptionally famous in post-war Germany, had unusual license to construct his own history of the, of the discovery. And so the standard theor uh, story persists. Clearly, there are competing narratives here. Um, and I really do not think the standard story can ever be completely dislodged. But there have been changes that include Meitner and physics more fairly. Here's one. Uh, in 1991, the Deutsches Museum, after tremendous numbers of complaints from large numbers of people, finally did revise their fission display. The Arbeitstisch from Otto Hahn, the work table of Otto Hahn sign, is gone. And instead, there's much more text, which really does include Lisa Meitner and Fritz Strassmann much more equitably. And probably the most enduring visibility is here uh, in element 109, which has been named for Lisa Meitner, Meitnerium. Um, really, when it comes to a periodic table, it doesn't get more visible than that. It's, um, it's everywhere in the, in the world. And one really would hope that it would encourage people to learn more about Lisa Meitner and her work in the difficult times in which she lived. So thank you very much. NSCL is a world-leading laboratory for rare isotope research and nuclear science education. Operation of NSCL as a national user facility is supported by the Experimental Nuclear Physics Program of the National Science Foundation. Thank <laughs> you.